Welcome everybody to this uh, presentation of our Qualitative Methods Web Master Class Webinar Series, which is a, a program in partnership between the International Institute for Qualitative Methodology and Atlas TI. Uh, today we have uh, as presenter Dr. Alex Clark, professor of the Faculty of Nursing at the University of Alberta. Um, I will now ask uh, my colleague Yvette Magwat from uh, IIQM uh, to introduce Dr. Clark. Thanks, Ricardo. Dr. Alex Clark is Professor and Associate Dean of Research at the University of Alberta Faculty of Nursing in Canada. His research draws on complexity and realist theory to understand health outcomes. His special interests are in chronic disease management, heart disease, and self-care. This work has been published in some of the world's most impactful journals, including the British Medical Journal, Journal of Advanced Nursing, Social Science and Medicine and Heart. He currently chairs the IIQM board and is co-editor of the International Journal of Qualitative Methods. Alex, thanks for being here today. Well, uh, hi everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to be here today. Um, I, uh, I'm really excited to be here to present um, this uh, interactive session on critical realism and realist evaluation, an overview for everyone. So no matter what your discipline is, no matter if you're an earlier career graduate student, or a senior professor, uh, no matter what discipline you work in. I hope this overview is going to give you a good sense of what critical realism is, how you could use it, and also the unique nature of realist evaluation. Um, if you have any questions that you don't get a chance to ask during the session today, please feel free to send me an email afterwards or um, you can tweet um, during the session or after the session a question or a comment that I'll address afterwards, hashtag IIQMWebinar. Um, and also you can use my own Twitter handle at AlexClark1944. And I think one of the things in particular that excites me um, during these kinds of sessions is that they bring us together from across the world, from north, south, east and west, whether it's day or night, whether you're at work or home, whether you're accessing the session now or on YouTube later. And we can go on some wonderful journeys and linking us together on this journey will be very, very important today. There are other opportunities if you want to link in. We've got our Qualitative Health Research Conference coming up in October. Um, we'll be some other chances to hear about methods like critical realism and hear also the wonderful things that IIQM and Atlas have got to offer. But for today, we're going to go on a journey. Uh, and it's a journey that some of us will be unfamiliar with. And it's a journey, I think, that will also be quite profound, giving us new ways of understanding, new ways of seeing, and new ways of wondering. And in particular, I'd like us to consider today the wonder of why. And we're going to keep going back to the wonder of why throughout our session today. And perhaps for some of us, we'll end up seeing why in a new way. And we're going to cover some basic key concepts as we consider the wonder of why. We're going to think about what does it mean when we describe things as simple or complicated or complex as we cover some key concepts. Secondly, we're going to overview the tenets or the principles of critical realism before finally discussing the nature and the use of realist evaluation, no matter where we're coming from and no matter where we may be going in our research. And like I say, if you have any comments or thoughts, please join the discussion afterwards by asking a question, or you can use the hashtag IAQMWebinar as we go. And by being part of this session today, perhaps we'll see some old problems in our disciplines and in our research in a new way. Understanding all problems and addressing them in a new way, I think, is really important and really central to critical realism. But it all comes back, really, to wondering about why. Why do things happen in the world as they do? And why questions in the world are all around us every day? Why do the trees move when nothing seems to be pushing them? Is it because of invisible ghosts? Is it because the trees themselves are alive? 
or is it because high pressure air is moving from that higher pressure to lower pressure through the effects of wind? Why is that person angry at me? What is guiding their behavior? What motivations and beliefs and attitudes or social factors are guiding what they do? Why did it rain again today? If you're in Australia, why is it so cold at the moment? If you're in Canada, why is it so hot? Why questions are about us every single day in so many different ways? And why questions also happen in our disciplines a lot? When you look, for example, at the discipline of economics and econometrics, why questions are central to economics? Why did the global recession happen? Even six, seven years later, we still don't really understand why. Why, the complexity theorist David Byrne posited, do most criminals reoffend? And you can see that why questions have real social implications as well, not only for research, but also for society and economies as well. And why questions also have implications for health. Increasingly in health, we know what treatments and services people should be receiving, but why don't they always access them? So why is a really important social, economic and health issue too? So why is important? But let's also think about what why is not. Well, why questions are not about prediction like you would do with a regression analysis. And why answers can really help us think about what reality is like, but why is not about addressing or helping with prediction. Neither is why about description. Why is not just about merely documenting the world as it appears. It's about going farther and it's about going deeper into the world to explain and understand why is reality like what it is like. But why is not just describing the world. It is going further than that. And why is not about intervening. For sure it can help us, but in our rush to intervene, such as is exemplified in randomized control trials and the kudos that are associated with that, so often we are intervening before we don't really understand why the world is the way it is. So we have to focus research before we can intervene on why the world is like the way it is and why might our intervention be able to address that. So in our minds we have to think of why not as prediction, not as description or not of intervention, though it can help with all these things, but about moving beyond, moving beyond the way things look, the way reality is, to try and explain and account for what is beyond that. What factors are interacting and coming together to cause changes in the things that we can see and that are more apparent to us? Why are why questions so important then? Well, as I've said, they're really important for economics, they're really important for health, and they're really important for social factors. But I think they're also more particularly important for the state of research just now. And in particular, complexities in relation to that research. In many of our disciplines, we have more and more data, big data, linked data, messy data, but we have more and more data about the world. But in addition to this greater volume of data, there's more and more unexplained patterns and results than ever. So often we're not getting the results we expect to get. So often the trends we think we see are not the trends that happen. And so there are more unexplained patterns and results than ever before. We also want to improve the world, 
but a plausible explanation is necessary and important for meaningful change. Otherwise, we are effectively taking a shot in the dark in order to make the world a better place. So, why is important for data and explaining data and more data, but also for using those data better? And recognizing that there's more complexity in the world. And theory and policy, for example, the Medical Research Council Framework for Evaluating Complex Interventions, are increasingly steering us to see the world through a complexity lens. So when we think about complexity and why, what do we mean by this? What effectively is complexity? And I'm going to distinguish it from two other concepts or words. I'm going to distinguish it from what is simple and also what is complicated, so that we never use those three words interchangeably again but we only use them appropriately. So when things are simple in the world and when our solutions to things are simple, we tend to follow simple recipe-like solutions. In situation A, do B and C will happen. Often an approach that's very common in clinical guidelines. And this is a recipe-like approach where we think if we follow the recipe to the letter, then we're destined for success. But of course, we know from research results, so often the results we expect from our studies, from our randomized control trials and our pre-test, post-tests, for example, aren't the results we expect. And we do not know why. And I would say the reason why is because the world is not simple. Some people have argued that as an alternative to that simple approach, things are complicated. And when things are complicated, formula and procedure, precedence and history, expertise, knowledge and experience can all be harnessed so that we can put everything into our view and understanding of the world. And when we do that using these formula, these precedents, our expertise and our experience, we can be very highly assured of success. It is indeed rocket science. Put everything in and we are very highly guaranteed, even with a very highly complicated task, that we will be successful because everything can be incorporated in our complicated model. And this is very much the approach to research that you see often in randomized control trials, whereby we approach as researchers complicated interventions in the way that we would approach interventions like medicines, where we think we understand what's going on in our heads and on paper. And sometimes we do research studies that show what we expect to happen does happen in our studies and our interventions are successful and then we think we have cracked the complicated problem and then we roll the intervention out to the real world and sometimes it's really successful but often we don't get also what we're expecting and we can't understand this and our complicated model doesn't always assimilate it and we think we must have missed things out from the equation. So we have to make our equations more complicated. But the lessons from econometrics show us no matter, even with the most sophisticated equations, complicated approaches to social problems, social issues, continue to prove inadequate. In my own research field of heart disease, this is, for example, exemplified by continued inconsistent research findings in relation to 20 years of research in heart failure disease management programs, in cardiac rehabilitation, in remote and telehealth monitoring programs. We're getting inconsistent findings when things should be working based on our complicated approach, but we don't know why. Why are findings inconsistent when we think we've included everything? 
and the challenge there is the paradigms and ways of thoughts in relation to what is complicated, we can only take them so far. We come up to a brick wall where we can't include everything we would like to include in our complicated model. The issue here is the world, I do not believe, is complicated. And we have to, like I argued in this research paper in the European Heart Journal, stop asking what interventions work best because that complicated mindset leads us to ask the wrong questions based on the wrong assumptions. And we should not assume that the world is complicated because I would counter it is not. The world is instead complex. What does this mean then for the world to be complex? Well, there's so much going on, so many systems, so many factors. Situations are unique. Things are in fluid and flux constantly. Formulae have limited application, even if we make them longer and longer and longer. Past successes give us limited guarantees for future success. Why? Because the world is not complicated, rather it is complex. Bringing a child up is complex. You can do so many different things. And those of you who have got two children will know, with your first child and your second child, you can do exactly the same thing, but get very different outcomes. Why? Because bringing children up is complex. And our world, I would argue, is complex too. There is so much going on in it. Situations are unique. Things are constantly in fluid and flux. Formulae have limited application. And so from now on, when we think about what is complicated and what is complex, we think of this image. And we remember that what is complicated is very different from what is complex. And I would say, yes, rocket science is complicated, but the world, the social world we are often researching is complex and needs complex approaches to it to explore and understand it and explain why things happen in it. Why questions then are very important and it's important that we understand fully what this why and this complexity of focus mean for our research. And here I'm going to draw on an example of a fun paper that I contributed to on what football teaches us or soccer teaches us about researching complex health interventions. This was published in the Britical Medical Journal um, a couple of years ago. And like health and education and social work and psychology and all manners of our disciplines and fields, outcomes are important in football. And the big issue in football is, of course, the outcome of the goal. It doesn't matter if you score more corners in the game than your opponent. What matters most if you score more goals. So goals are a key outcome in soccer. And for everyone out there, I would like to ask you, who would you rather have on your football team, assuming you want to score more goals? Would you like to have the player on your left? Alex Clark, or the player on your right, four times World Player of the Year, Lionel Messi. And in many ways, these two players look the same. Can you spot the difference? They have two arms, two legs, they're of similar height, their demeanor would appear overtly to be the same. There are many things we can measure about them that would produce the same measurements. So I would contend to you they are like two peas in the pod. Two legs, two feet, similar appearance, similar height, top income decile in their countries and both score goals regularly. Who would you rather have in your soccer team? And of course this really brings us to challenging issues around complexity. Issues 
about what matters most and what matters more in the world. Issues related to how we can know what's most important and in what ways does context matter. How can we begin to measure what's important or understand which parts are important and how do things change over time. And you can see, of course, Macy is preferable. But if we focus on the wrong things with the wrong lens, that can lead us to very, very wrong answers as to what matters most. What factors are important in explaining why Messi is different to Clark. And if you want to read more about that paper, I'll give you the reference at the end. So getting beyond what's superficial, what's readily observable, and what's easy to measure is really important in explaining properly. And just like a watch, we need to look beyond the face. We need to get to what's underneath to really understand why things are important. And this focus on why is the key aim of critical realism. And you probably heard this term before. Some of you would have heard different terms. Also, we can talk about complex realism or transcendental realism or critical realist or realist evaluation. But beyond these different labels, each of these fields or areas asks the question why. It seeks to explain and offer plausible explanations about the world. And you can read more about some of the topics we're going to cover in relation to critical realism in this paper that was published in the Advances in Nursing Science a few years ago. Critical realism focuses on explaining and it did so from a very clear question asked by the philosopher Roy Bhaskar. And this question was, what must reality be like for science to be possible? Which is a question that seems a little bit reversed to us. But assuming we do know about the world more, and there's evidence to corroborate that, what must the nature of reality be like for that to be possible? And asking this question provided the foundation for critical realism. And we're going to cover the main tenets of critical realism today, one by one through one to six. Tenet one. Critical realism posits the existence of an independent reality that can be fallibly known. The truth as Mulder and Scully reminded us, is out there. But critical realism posits that it's always mind independent, that a mind independent reality exists. What does this mean? Well, effectively it means that things exist separate from our beliefs or accounts of them. I can believe that my smoking won't damage my health, but that doesn't mean it won't damage my health or damage my heart. I can be wrong. There is a difference between the hermeneutical view I have of risk in my body and the reality of the, my risk in my body. Physical reality is separate from our accounts of it. And this isn't to say we can't do qualitative research into those accounts but it doesn't say that that objective reality is mind independent. Culture is the same. I can believe it's culturally appropriate in my organization for me to come to work without my shirt on. But my culture that I work in exists independent of my beliefs and is not just made so because I thought so. And I'll soon find out when I do come to work without my shirt on that I would get feedback from my colleagues and I was wrong and I misjudged the nature of my culture. Why? Because culture is mind independent. Tenet two, 
Critical Realism posits a stratified emergent generative ontology. It is a mouthful. What does this actually mean? Well, Critical Realism posits that reality is constituted by the actual, the empirical, and the real. And the actual, as you'll see on the screen there, refers to events and outcomes that happen in the world. But we can only ever perceive or know of those things through the empirical, which are our perceptions or processes like science, which are always fallible. We can never actually get to an infallible sense of what the actual is. There's only ever an account of what the actual is. And underneath the actual, causing changes in it, are factors within the real. And it's these underlying explanatory factors that critical realism seeks to explain and understand better. So you can think of these as the underlying agency and structural factors that cause changes in outcomes in the realm of the actual. And understanding and knowing more about them is very useful because that can help us get beyond what appears. Secondly, reality in critical realism is stratified. What does that mean? Well, it means that things are dependent on things that are more fundamental. So populations and social beings, the fact we are those things, are dependent on us being psychological beings which are dependent on the biological systems underpinning our psychology. This is not to say that those two things can be equated. The psychological is more than the biological. It's more than the cells. It's more than subatomic particles. But that said, if we were to take things away that are more basic within that hierarchy, things that are higher up the hierarchy would cease to exist. We are ultimately all just collections of some atomic particles. But critical realism would say we are more than that. And this is a stratified ontology. It is an emergent ontology as well because things can come together in and across these realms to create new things. Hydrogen and oxygen can come together to create something as very different in nature. Water, if it's right in the, in the right combinations. And in the same way, factors within and across these realms can come together with new factors emerging from them that have causal powers. Under critical realism, reality is stratified and emergent. Key tenet three then. Critical realism focuses on explanation. Not just looking at events as they are and describing them. Thinking the world is flat because it looks to be flat, but getting beyond, getting underneath to explain what is going on here, what is causing this to happen. Key tenet four, critical realism in relation to these explanations recognizes the role not only of agency, but also of structure of factors that exist within people, but factors that are also contextual as well. And it's this interplay or interaction between agency and structure, and this responsiveness to real complexity that defines critical realism as an explanatory approach. And this is a complex thing to grapple with, that things happen in the world, not just through to the action of individual agency, but also because context matters as well. Key tenet five, in this approach, reality is seen to be a complex, open system. There's a lot going on there. Things are not chaotic, but nor are they uniformly patterned either. Rather, reality is somewhere in the middle between chaos and uniformity. And reality is not a closed system that's abstracted and controllable or can be manipulated or simplified. Rather, reality is full of open systems that are uncontrollable and natural 
and highly, highly complex. And some of the problems in our research, as realist evaluation would indicate, come when we think closed systems are the same as open systems, where we think you can take research in closed systems and readily apply them into open systems. In these open systems, as I said though, things are not chaotic. Rather, to draw on the concept of Tony Lawson, the world is partially patterned. The concept realists use to refer to this are demi-regularities. It's not that trends don't exist, but neither are trends so common that they're universal. Rather, trends happen often, but often there are exceptions. And the key thing is, from realism, we can learn from both. We can learn from critical realism when we get the outcomes we expect, and we can learn from critical realism when we get the outcomes that we do not expect. What causes changes in outcomes? Well, finally, under this tenet, the approach that critical realism uses is quite different to the simple successionist recipe approach, where in situation A, do B and C will happen. We can take our sedentary person and give them an exercise program and think we're going to get destined levels of high activity and exercise. But of course this view of the world, though it's common in clinical guidelines, is very, very simplistic. Rather, reality is generative and complex. Many, many factors come together to cause outcomes and events in the real world. A small change in just one of these factors could lead to a big change or a phase shift in events happening. Why? Because reality is complex. Our final tenet then. Where does this lead us? Well, critical realism, I believe, leads us to an approach that advocates methodological eclecticism and post-disciplinarity. Why? Because we are led always by ontology, by reality. We are not led by our methodological predilection or our disciplinary lens. Always and ever we are led by the nature of reality, so that we don't have the blinkers on and what we're looking at reality like. So that we can see reality hopefully for more of its complexity and bring together whatever research methods are useful to understand that complexity. So, realist research puts ontology before method. It advocates using any method you want or can to better understand and capture that complexity, qualitative, mixed or quantitative, and explaining that complexity on this ontology. And this is what critical realist research looks like. The most notable manifestation more recently of this work has been in realist evaluation. And realist evaluation posits addressing a key question. What works for whom, when, and why? And you've probably heard of realist evaluation from the work of Ray Pawson and Nick Tilley and their book, Realistic Evaluation, published by SAGE in 1997. And often in research, we don't address that question of what works. We are addressing a question of what works in a very flawed way. We are thinking in a simple recipe-like approach that there can be one intervention or one type of intervention that works everywhere. And this is kind of akin to saying, do Manchester United win or do the New York Giants win? And of course, our immediate response to that is, well, it depends against who, in what context. And this starts to move us from a simplistic ontology to a more complex ontology, where we think not just about what works, but about what works for whom, when, and why. And the origins of realistic valuation come from seeing that that question and the assumptions behind what works are wrong. Just when we think we know we've got the answer, 
we find a lack of replicability of successful interventions and programs. Just like they did in realistic evaluation for CCTV and crime prevention. But we've got a lack of insight into the reasons for these variations. Why what we think should happen doesn't happen. And this is really challenging for us when we're coming from a complicated lens or a simplistic lens because those approaches lack explanatory power. And I think it's also reflective of the fact they pay little attention to ontology. To think what is missing from current research. To think of the depth and ontological approaches that guide us to ask different questions in different ways. All interventions have winners and losers, but what works for whom, when and why is a far more complex question to ask with a far more complex lens. And many researchers using realist evaluation have done that. They've done that, for example, to understand why some people benefit from health programs and other people don't. To understand why some mothers benefit from breastfeeding interventions and others don't. To understand why some school meal programs in schools benefit some kids, but not others. A more sophisticated approach that asks a more sophisticated question. Moving from what works to understand what works for whom, when and why. And as we start to unpack this, we can see that we are looking to get to what's beneath. We are looking to get to what drives changes in the things that we see more superficially and more overtly in our outcomes. And this is a journey into understanding mechanisms. What is a mechanism? Well, let's take a moment and let's think each of us of the best and worst teacher you ever had. And that could be a teacher in elementary school or high school where bad teachers seem to gather or university. But think of the best and worst teacher you ever had. What was your bad teacher like? How did they affect you? How did they make you feel? How were they different from your good teacher? How did that teacher behave? How were they different? What was it that was different in the way that they affected you? And you can see here what's important in these teachers is not their qualifications or their physical appearance. It's not what type of school or class often that they were teaching, but it's about what they did for us. It was the powers that they exercise or did not exercise with us. And it's these mechanisms that are important in critical realism and realist evaluation. The mechanisms more hold the power of the intervention, far less than the characteristics of the intervention. Let's think of another example. A domestic violence intervention that was rolled out in America. And domestic violence is a common and concerning social problem that people wanted to address through mandatory arrest policies. And this is a movement, if you like, from a police officer being called to an incident in the home and giving a warning without arrest to coming to the incident in the home and giving a mandatory arrest. And when these domestic violence interventions were carried out, the pilots showed that they were successful in reducing domestic violence. The hypothesis was then struck that mandatory arrest policies will reduce domestic violence out with the successful pilots. So what's going on in this intervention? Well, we have a pilot context and we have in the pilot intervention an arrest in public with a mechanism of public shame and vilification. And this reposting identified was often linked to a reduction in domestic violence. However, when the pilot was rolled out, into the real world, something different happened. What was that? Well, in the real world context, the arrest was made in public, but the public shame mechanism wasn't triggered. Rather, an annoyance mechanism was triggered that led to an increase in domestic violence. 
Why? Because context was different. In the context of the real world, there was far less common social shame with public arrest, and far more commonly there was an annoyance. And this led to social harms, an increase in domestic violence, based on this rollout. So it's important that we ask these questions about what works for whom, when and why, and recognise the power of mechanisms and the importance of context, and recognise that what has the power in the intervention, not the intervention itself, but the mechanism through which it's work, is moderated by context to then influence outcomes. So this has led to an approach called realist evaluation. And realist evaluation means that when we use it in relation to randomized trials, we can not only measure outcomes, but also explain outcomes. We can incorporate it also into process evaluations to better understand what's going on in interventions. And realist evaluation also has appeared as dedicated realist evaluation, done separately from trials and process evaluations as realist studies in themselves. And finally, a more recent development in realist evaluation has been realist synthesis, which is a model where you take that view of context and mechanisms and apply it to systematic review to create a new model for systematic review that asks what is it about interventions that gives them powers, accounting for mechanisms and context and outcomes. So, for example, name and shame interventions in different fields are similar, but work the same. You can have a name and shame intervention in the top of the screen there for people who don't pay their tax, like a television license in the UK. You can have a name and shame intervention showing surgeons' death rates for surgery to try and increase the quality of surgery. For university league tables to try and encourage universities and professors to commit to better teaching. And finally, for car safety records. Understanding interventions in one field can help us understand interventions in other, but seeing that interventions' effectiveness are based not on the nature of the intervention or for the field, but whether they successfully trigger the name and shame mechanism underneath. So that's a very quick overview of realist evaluation. It's an up and coming field. Some people argue that realist evaluation is badly done. Some people are arguing that, well, critical realism is philosophically incoherent and that the two critical realism and realist approaches aren't well aligned. Great work recently published by Sam Porter in Evaluation. It's an important to be wary of these critical thoughts and processes. But it's important also to understand. To understand as we approach realist evaluation and critical realism, the main tenets of critical realism, like we've covered today, that the truth is out there, that the truth is deep, stratified, emergent and generative, that we need to focus on explanation and in our explanations focus on agency and structure, to see reality as a complex open system and approach it in our research in a methodologically eclectic way and post-disciplinary way that puts reality first. So, let's think, is your research approach simple? complicated or complex? How could critical realism add value to seeing old problems in, new way, in your field or your work? How could knowledge of mechanisms and context and outcomes help your research? So important for us to think why. I've included some references there about what critical realism is and how you can use it about what complexity and complexity theory is, and finally, how you can research complex interventions. But I'd like to thank you for your listening today, and I'm interested in carrying on the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. I am going to ask um, uh, Jeremiah to, to ask uh, a question. I will give you the microphone, Jeremiah. Go ahead. 
Yes, do you do you have a microphone? Okay, so what I will do is I am going to read the question, Alex, and his question is the following. Does the critical realist paradigm align with constant comparative analysis? Do you know which country Jeremiah is from, Ricardo? Uh, no, but Jeremiah, uh, why don't you answer that? If perhaps you can write this down, what country are you from? Okay, uh, while we wait for his answer. I can you, answer. You, yes, for sure. Go ahead. Um, I think um, very much, Jeremiah, critical realism does align with constant comparative analysis or an approach, because in particular it views that causation is contingent, that there are many factors in that generative approach to causation going on, and we can't just approach causation in a very simplistic recipe-like way. And I think constant comparative analysis has that approach to patterning and complexity, and indeed in realist evaluation, Poston and Tilly advocate in a very grounded theory-like way that when we are looking at how interventions work and invoking mechanisms and context, that we need to generate theory about what that is. And I think doing a constant comparative approach or analysis is the best way to develop that theory. So yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Alex. And everybody, when you ask a question, could you please introduce yourselves with uh, with the country where you come from and perhaps something about uh, your discipline? I, I will give the microphone to uh, Subash, and, and my apologies if I do not pronounce your name the right way. Uh, Subash Tapa, the microphone is opened. Go ahead. Hello? Yes, go ahead, please. How realist evaluation research uses both qualitative and quantitative methods? How both the qualitative and quantitative data are analyzed? Subhash, it's a pleasure to speak to you, and that's a really good question. Um, how are they analyzed? I think you can analyze them in any way you want, so long as you are true to your ontology, so long as you try to analyze them in ways that can account for complexity and go deeper in terms of explanation. So thinking of the Messi and Clark example, try to focus your quantitative measurements on things that are most important, perhaps leveraging or drawing on your qualitative analysis to understand what factors are important. So to go from quant to qual, from qualitative to quantitative, in ways that can lead you to be better sure that you are measuring what's most important and everything that is important is understood and linked together in your model or your approach. So there's no necessary order for it, qual to quant, quant to qual, but really trying to get to the heart of what matters more and what matters most and using those two different types of data collection to help you. Thank yeah, you. My next question is, how qualitative and quantitative data inform the model building process in a realist evaluation? So thinking of that approach, I think you need qualitative to first try and capture all the things that are more important. We need good observational field work to understand why Messi is better than Clark why things in an intervention that we might not think are important are actually important. And maybe we can measure some of them and we can use our quantitative research to measure those. Perhaps some of them are immeasurable, so we need to triangulate our qualitative and our quantitative research together. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. I have a question from Eva Saar and she is joining us from Melbourne. Australia, and I will give you the microphone so that you can answer your uh, you, so that you can ask your question. The microphone is open now. Okay, she may not have a working microphone, so I will read this for you, Alex. Uh, are she, she's asking the following: Are RCTs and process evaluations the only approaches a realist evaluation can complement? Is there advice on what criteria to include in theory development, literature review, and other data collection? Well, 
good uh, morning to you, Eva, from Melbourne. Um, I think you can use the tenets of realism and realist evaluation, not just to do trials and process evaluations, but you can do dedicated realist evaluation. And that might look qualitative only, it might look quantitative only, or it could be mixed method. My advice to you would be be true to the principles or tenets of the approach and use whichever methods work best for you to generate most explanatory power. And that concept of explanatory power is so important for your theory development because your theory development speaks to, well, what's the aim of the theory? And the aim of the theory in realist evaluation should always be to explain the outcomes better accounting for not the characteristics of the intervention, but the probable or main mechanisms involved and how those vary by context. But explanatory power should be the driver. Thank you very much, Alex. And I have a question, question from Sandeep, ready? And I will open your microphone, uh, go ahead. And could you also say where you come from? Please? Hi Alex, this is Sandy from Sydney. Um, my question is, what's the difference between scientific realism and critical realism? Well, good morning Sandy. Um, complex realism and critical realism, I think we're often using those terms interchangeably. Sometimes uh, there are different uh, types of realism and you can read other texts or books about that. Um, I think Critical realism advocates a complex ontology, and so I certainly use those terms quite interchangeably. I think sometimes if we are more purist, we would use the term critical realism, but perhaps sometimes we don't want to use all the concepts associated with critical realism, so we might use or interpret a variation of it and label it complex realism. But I would always ask myself when people are using labels, what are they assuming ontologically and read and go back to those basic ontological assumptions to see are they perhaps calling it the right thing, would I use a different term? Thank you, Alex. I will give the microphone now to David Blaine. David is joining us from Glasgow. So uh, let me let me give the microphone to you, David. Uh, just a second, please. Go ahead. Your microphone is open. Uh, yeah. Hi, Alex. Hi, David. How are you? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I can. Good. Thanks. <laughs> um, so it's a question about um, our theories, I suppose, and it was about whether there's some more work to be done developing. I guess, realist approaches to particularly qualitative methods. I'm thinking about Pawson's uh, theorizing the interview, where there's almost a specific attempt to get participants' views on mechanisms. So there's a, a bit of teaching around what is a mechanism to do first. Yes. Yes, uh, absolutely, David. I think that's a really uh, good question. Um, of course, there's always more work, and I think we are just beginning to really um, move the realist and, and realist evaluation processes uh, and methods forward. And Ray Pawson certainly in his earlier work advocated this notion of the teacher learner and it was an interviewer's job in an interview to try and learn. And you might talk to people who have an experience of the intervention or you might talk to professionals who work with lots of people in the intervention and try to understand then from the professional's perspective the factors that affect many people receiving that intervention which would be more contextual and from the people receiving the intervention what their own individual journeys were like and understand they're in better the mechanisms. I think the main challenge is always critical realism and realist evaluation draws a distinction between the subjective and the objective and reality is always mind independent and it's very very hard to objectively get to mechanisms, we can't. Um, we're often relying on perceptions of mechanisms. Uh, and one thing I think it's important is to think of perhaps we can use qual and quantitative research together better in future to look at subjective accounts of mechanisms but then to see if it's possible to measure aspects of those mechanisms as well. 
and then to see if the perceived effects are borne out and real effects on outcomes that are objectively assessed. Thanks, David. It's a great question. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. I will now give the microphone to Justin. Justin Jagos, could you um, could you introduce yourself first? I, I will I will see if you have a working microphone. Go ahead. Your microphone is open. Hi there. Yeah. Hi, Alex. Can you hear Hi. me? Yes, I can hear you, Justin. Hi, it's uh, Justin Jagos from the University of Liverpool. Uh, thank you so much for that really beautiful lecture. Uh, so my question is as follows. If we are suggesting that realist research requires us to study elements of reality which are beyond observation, how do you advocate to policymakers that what has been produced through such research is safe and reliable? Oh, such an easy question you give me, Justin. No, that's, a, that's a tricky question. I think there's lots of examples in the world of things that aren't readily observable that are important or we need different research methods and sometimes it's more about using observational methods as in field work versus going for what's easily measurable and I think you know in, in my own field of cardiac um, my own view as a realist would be the social values that practitioners use to drive the intervention um, is so much more important than the location of them but location is easily measured and there's a whole narrative and discourse around that. I do think analogies are useful and, and obviously in this webinar I've used the analogy of soccer to try and better illustrate the folly of focusing on what is readily observable because there are many aspects of Messi and myself that are very readily observable but aren't ontologically important in terms of the outcomes at stake. Um, and when we start to think like that, we can start to move our thinking in different directions and perhaps start to use a broader range of research methods to better try and get to what's most important. Um, I think we're at the beginning of the journey. I think it's important that critical realists and realist evaluators stick together because we're often trying to move in the right directions and encourage policymakers and government and practitioners in particular to ask different questions on a different ontological basis and use different methods to explain better. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, we are running out of time. We have a few more questions. I will, I will try to give the microphone to two more people, but if that's not possible, at least one of them. Uh, I'm going to give the microphone to you, Dick Blackmore. Uh, D or Di Blackmore, uh, just a second, please. Uh, go ahead. Could you please ask your question? And you are from Scotland, University of Stirling. Okay, so I am going to read the question. Uh, in my realist synthesis, I am finding it difficult Fine. Oh, go ahead. You're there. I have terrible, terrible, terrible. Just, just read it out for me. Can you hear me? Yes, very clearly. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I'm in the middle of a realist synthesis at the moment, and I'm finding it difficult to get quantitative evidence. So it's quite difficult to judge what the most important mechanisms are. You got any thoughts on that at all? Yes. Is it die? Yeah, die. Yes. Yeah, good to hear you from Scotland. Hi, good evening. Um, I think when you get down to the work, and I do realist evaluations as well, and it's messy. And I speak as somebody who's just finishing a realist evaluation that started off with 9,000 studies and ended up with 15. Qualitative and quantitative studies of heart failure disease management programs and the mechanisms therein. Um, I think you have to be very clear on how you define a mechanism and operationalize that at the beginning of your review and then look at many, many studies for hints, quantitative hints in this sense of what mechanisms are. Now that could be perhaps a process measurement because perhaps like your area and my area, few dedicated studies are focused on mechanisms. So I don't think what you've done is unusual. I think it's very normal. Um, we need more quantitative studies that measure mechanisms better and perhaps your work can serve as a call for that, as well as deriving from the literature what you can. Maybe in the future you could do a primary research study that would better identify a main mechanism in the particular field that you're looking at. Yeah. But it's a common problem 
we yeah. need more better good first primary research. Okay, so yeah, call for research. That's a, that's always a good one to end up with, isn't it? <laughs> yes, and more yeah. money. Okay, for, thank you. More money for that research. Yeah. Thank you very much, Guy. And uh, there are a few more questions, but we are running out of time. So I would like to ask uh, those of you whose questions were not answered uh, to communicate uh, with Alex Clark. Uh, he gave us uh, his uh, contact information earlier. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask now, um, Yvette, if you could say the final few words. Thanks, Ricardo, and thanks, Alex. That was a great webinar. Just wanted to let everyone know um, that right now the uh, early bird registration is open for the Qualitative Health Research Conference taking place this October in Toronto. You can go to our website, www.iaqm.ualberta.ca, for more information and to register. Uh, QHR did sell out last year, so register early this year. Thanks. Thank you very much, Yvette. Uh, I want to thank you, Alex, for, 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 for joining us uh, this time. Uh, and thank you, all of you, for coming from so many different places. As, as Alex said earlier, at the very beginning, one of the wonderful things of this uh, webinar series is that we have people from uh, everywhere, different uh, times and, and from different disciplines, all joining uh, for the interest and passion, perhaps, for the qualitative. So thank you, Alex, and thank you, all of you. And I hope that you can join us again uh, in the next uh, presentations of this series. Just go back to the IIQM uh, website page and you will find the information. So thank you, Alex. Would you like to say a few last words? No, I just thank everyone for uh, participating in the webinar and good luck with your realist endeavors. Yes, thank you. And Freya, as well as Beth, uh, you have questions that we could not answer, plus, but please feel free to contact us. And in fact, uh, Alex, why don't you go back to the initial slide of your presentation?